Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Gavin Evans. I'm the Operations Director at the Digital Accessibility Centre. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of a background about the Digital Accessibility Centre first. Um, we're a social enterprise based in uh, South Wales, as you could probably tell from the accent. Um, we're a 100%, uh, we operate on a 100% not-for-profit basis and we, we consist of about 30 individuals, 80% uh, of whom have some form of disability or access issue to a, a digital product and they form our core test team. Um, we're also a Living Wage Foundation accredited employer uh, and we, we, we work with a lot of organisations within the UK uh, and Australia and America as well. Um, I suppose one of the key things to consider when you're reviewing applications or when you're, you're putting together a strategy um, is to audit and include certain, uh, say for example, WCAG 2 references uh, and when you're reviewing an application's technical standard, that's great. Um, some of you may actually use uh, involve users within the process as well, which is brilliant. So what I want to do now is I want to take you through uh, some of the individuals that you should consider and also the, some of the applications or, or software in this case uh, that you should consider when reviewing your application. So the key considerations are for physical user, physically impaired users, cognitive impaired users, hearing and visually impaired users. Um, and they use different assistive technologies, which probably you're in, in an accessibility event, some of you may be familiar with them and some may not. Um, on desktop, you've got VoiceOver on a Mac. Uh, you've also got JAWS for Windows on NVDA. These are screen reading software. You may be familiar with them. Um, or even switch control or keyboard only access for those who can't use um, a mouse. Um, some of you may, may actually not be f more familiar with switch control because uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, Stephen Hawking is a switch user and he actually has a switch embedded in his cheekbone which um, he controls uh, the software and generates uh, speech from that and also navigates away uh, around the computer screen. Um, and also speech to text or Dragon naturally speaking is the most popular within uh, the world these days, seems to take over the market. Um, zoom or magnification to magnify the screen uh, multiple amount of up to 64 times on the screen. Also, not just on desktop, but mobile as well. Um, if you've got an Android or an iOS device, you've got native accessibility features built into the device itself. Um, we've got uh, TalkBack on Android, uh, S-Voice. We've got switch control for Android as well for those with a mobility impairment. Um, we've also got Siri, we've got VoiceOver. Loads of you are probably familiar with Siri. Um, Zoom on iOS as well, to be able to magnify content as well for those with low vision uh, and assistive touch. So for physically impaired users, um, this is actually Bex, this is Rebecca, she's um, one of our senior accessibility analysts and she has a mobility impairment. Um, so she navigates her way around the screen using voice activation software and also combined with the mouse as well, but um, she gets quite quite tired uh, by using the mouse, so that's why she reverts to voice activation software. Um, and this is voice activation software on screen here in the bottom left, where it actually, uh, by saying voice commands, um, you can output little bubbles on screen, similar to what you see in Google Maps. Um, and I've got a quick video here of, of Bex, very short video of how she navigates. Link. Thanks, Chris. Box. One, two, three, button. Go back. Page down. Okay. So basically that's voice activation software uh, in action. Uh, and Bex is uh, basically allowed to navigate the way around the computer screen um, by verbally saying different commands. Um, and the reason why I've put up here about a Z index below 100, what tends to happen, um, we've got different versions of Dragon, naturally speaking, and below version 13, you tend to have an issue when you use Z indexes uh, above 100 on a page. So if you've got an overlay um, or a pop-up or anything that uses Z indexes, be mindful of the fact that Zoom, to, uh, sorry, uh, voice activation software may have a problem because the actual buttons that get tagged go behind the layer. So then that's why, because the issue uh, with Dragon 13 and below. Um, what are the considerations for mobility impaired users? 
Uh, well, we've got focus issues, so don't use display none because that will have, obviously that was going to hide it from everyone, or display zero, and it's not going to allow keyboard users to be able to tab to different elements on screen, um, provide additional focus indicators uh, through hover active focus, using the background or an outline, possibly two pixels thick, and you can see the outline uh, when you tab through um, different elements on screen. And this is just one example here on, um, on Maersk website. And you can see there is a good color background when you're tabbing through. And this is something that you really want. Um, now, if you're actually testing an application or you're getting a user to test an application, you might think, oh, this is great. You, I can tab through every single element on screen as, as a keyboard user. Um, and you can select different elements. That's fantastic. However, you've got to make sure that you drive the page to different states. And this is what's key. So for to ensure that a mouse user is actually um, basically, sorry, a keyboard user is getting the same experience as a mouse user. So I'm just going to show you again now, uh, this time with a mouse, when you hover over different areas. Uh, and you can probably see, as soon as you get to import, so the mouse hovers over and you've got a few drop downs. So keyboard users, in this case, can't actually navigate to those sub uh, menu items. So there's ways you can do within the CSS. Um, you know, in this case, it's probably hidden using display none, and then you've got to change it to uh, display block, or basically ensuring that you use the event um, uh, event handlers, um, sorry, keyboard event handlers, to allow a user to interact with these areas as well, uh, and that way keyboard users can navigate to the items. On mobile, you've got different considerations for gestures that are built in. Um, you've got a carousel, possibly. And you can see on the Sky app here, actually, this app, this app is quite old. Um, you've got a carousel where users swipe through to different items. But for a mobility-impaired user, this can be really problematic for, by performing the actual swipe gesture from right to left. So other considerations you, you need to take into consideration, such as placing a button possibly underneath the carousel, um, or don't have carousels in the first place, um, and providing an alternative to that. Um, I've just put down here on the, the Channel 4 app, and this is, uh, yeah, um, the cholesterol and the, all that container there is actually one selectable element. Um, because what we don't want to see is that items that you select are too small for mobility impaired users. Because if you can't actually focus on them, then you can imagine for a mobility impaired user that has limited dexterity, they can't actually focus on very small items. And if you look at iOS human interface guidelines or the Android developer guidelines, they'll actually state that between 44 pixels or 88 by 88 pixels uh, on a retina display. But also, it's between about 8 to 10 millimeters in size for the actual touch space that you should build towards. So something to take into consideration there. Uh, for hearing impaired users, um, one of the, the, the accessibility considerations would be to provide captions. Um, that is a must. Or even providing a text alternative as a bare minimum. But to meet the AA standard under WCAG 2, you've got to be able to uh, provide captions on important speech or sound that's on, on video. Um, or, or even by providing uh, BSL. Um, so you can see here, you've got, I've got a CC on the right-hand side, which is closed captioning. Um, there's actually two forms of uh, captions, open captioning and closed captions. Open captions are basically built in or baked into the player. You can see in the bottom left. And also closed captions are where you can switch them on and off, uh, which is very, uh, you know, the best possible way you can provide captions. Um, for deaf users, English may be their second language. Um, actually, the readability age of a deaf user is eight years of age. So you've got to make sure that the readability of the, the site, the content that you provide, um, is low enough to be read by all users, basically. For cognitive impaired users, um, this could be somebody with dyslexia. It could be somebody um, with a learning difficulty. It could be somebody with a brain injury. Um, con the way that you've designed content could be difficult for many user groups. It could be moving content on the screen. should be limited to five seconds or provide a pause feature, for example. The way you've designed content, it could be flying in from the left. It could be the text that you've used or the font type that you've used. Italic font tends to be quite difficult to understand for dyslexic users. 
Um, moving animation, you can see here the beach ball, it's, it's actually drawn your attention to it. I know that certain uh, advertisements, they're there and they're intended to actually draw your attention, but they actually could be failing guidelines and they could be so distracting that it'll stop the user from uh, continuing to read the page. Short-term memory can be affected as well. If you've got labels, for example, on an input field on a form, um, and I don't know if anybody does that here, but if you rely on a placeholder attribute, uh, does anybody do that? I hope not. You've got to provide a static visible label because if you provide a placeholder attribute, users will cause short-term memory, memory, and when you click on it, the actual placeholder disappears. So they may not remember what the label was for the field they were trying to input in in the first place was. For low vision users, uh, this is Gary on the right hand side, he's using a zoom text and also a, a, an attached zoom text keyboard here as well, you can see the high contrast. Um, Gary has limited vision, he has uh, glaucoma and he also has 20% um, uh, vision in one eye as well. Um, and basically he, he relies on magnifying the content. Um, on a mobile device it could be providing uh, a widget to actually resize. Um, it could be using zoom text as well. Um, but one of the considerations when you resize using control and plus probably on a website, that when you do resize that everything maintains. Can you see the export book and look up in the top? What's happened is the contains actually disappeared. Uh, so the background um, has obviously uh, disappeared completely. So for a low vision user that's resizing content, that's gonna be extremely difficult obviously to see for anyone. Okay, so um, with text that may not be large enough, there, were, there is a consideration for mobile. Um, does anybody develop mobile applications here um, or even responsive design? Um, if you do, then just make sure that you don't suppress the zoom on mobile applications. Um, the reason why is because users can't actually pinch and zoom content on screen. So if you do suppress the zoom, this is just a, a little bit of code here. Um, using this uh, scalable one and probably user scalable one as well. So that means it's fixed. Um, and that's probably the, the intention, but to take into consideration low vision users, this is an absolute no-no. So underneath you, you've got to ensure that it uh, adjusts to double its size or 200% of the initial size. For blind users, um, you've got many different assistive technologies. Um, we've got voiceover on the Mac, you've got voiceover on the iOS, like I mentioned with TalkBack for Android, JAWS for Windows, uh, and this is Jamie here, one of our team members. Um, but some of the considerations, they have to have alternatives to visual content, uh, to mouse control, um, and also the visual structure must be presented programmatically. So if you've got headings, for example, on a page, um, such as on, on, this is actually JAWS, where you press insert and F6 and that pops up the headings dialog. So they've got to be in a logical order for users to be able to make sense, uh, some sort of semantic meaning to the user. Because if you, were, you had, a, for example, a, a newspaper and you were reading a newspaper, um, what would you go for? You'd actually look for the different headings in the first place and then the user would go through from that heading, yeah, that's the heading I want, and then you'd read the content in relation to that. And that's exactly the same way as a user, a screen reader user would want to navigate the page sometimes, especially if they're familiar with your application. Um, on uh, iOS, on VoiceOver, it's exactly the same. We've got the rotor technique where you can actually flick through headings as well. And for those who develop in uh, HTML5 and use an ARIA, you can use um, roles as well to be able to expose that to um, sectioning elements to screen read users also. Um, that's a, a must. Um, on mobile, um, I've just quickly shown you this section here, because this is what we come across and see quite a lot, where you've used pseudo class uh, before or after, whether you've got an icon font, for example. The only trouble is this is problematic for iOS and voiceover, because it doesn't actually correctly understand um, the, the icon font itself. So believe it or not, some, it's ridiculous as it seems, even if you see an account or a sign in and you see uh, the head, for example, a woman's head, for example, it actually announces as woman's head or cap B or cap C. Um, so what we've been, done here as a workaround is we've actually provided ARIA to hide the content, so hiding the icon font itself and then span that content off screen so it's read to a screen reader user. So it still understands, a screen reader user will still understand that it's referring to a favorite, okay? Um, updating content, um, 
I think this is sort of goes without saying, really. If anything steals focus or if you've got a, a pop-up or if there's an advertisement, ensure that um, the focus actually sent to the layer if it's intentional or be aware of the fact that if anything does steal fo focus, is there going to be a problem? What sort of experience does it provide for screen reducers? It can be really confusing sometimes. Okay, so how do you get this done? You've got, uh, within your organization, you could actually have an accessibility champion already. If not, then actually you could be the accessibility champions. Um, write an accessibility policy strategy, include references to guidelines, uh, provide training internally as well to your designers, developers, and content teams, um, and audit and test through all stages, um, even using automated software, because I think from an automated perspective, if you've got a QA, a test team, uh, they probably use something like Selenium or Cucumber, and there's JavaScript uh, libraries that they can use with many rules for accessibility that can catch, capture things early on. Um, and also then going through to wireframe, going through to designs, going through to uh, functional HTML pages, it's ensuring you capture things all the way along the process is key. Um, and get help to certify content as well, oh that's me. Um, or, or even the con on the team. But I think getting users involved is, I think, the one that you should do. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to make something accessible to that user group. So why not involve that user group in the first place? I've got a short video here of uh, Ziad. Have I got enough time for this? Yeah, great. My name is Ziad Khan. I'm aged 40. I work at the Digital Accessibility Centre in Neath, West Wales, as a website analyst, testing websites for uh, accessibility. Uh, my condition I suffer with is glaucoma. This was brought about due to ongoing spikes in eye pressure. Um, as I was highly myopic from an early age but unbeknown to me I was suffering a loss of sight without any outward symptoms. When I first lost my vision um, I was incredibly isolated um, I could not leave my home initially I was just cocooned in my bedroom um, until such time that I received uh, my rehabilitation uh, training. However, um, a kind friend had uh, purchased and gave me a present of a mobile phone. I did have a phone, but it wasn't a talking phone. And he managed to track down a Motorola Razor phone, which at the time was, um, I didn't realize, but it was a talking phone of sorts. Um, you could depress the numbers on the keypad and they would feed back to you and uh, it also um, it would tell you what letters you were typing in. Um, when I received the text message it would read out the text messages to me. At that time, at that moment, it was a lifeline. Um, I cannot tell you how much of a lifeline it was. Um, you know, it was a lifeline. It was a form of communication it gave me a little hope that yes, I can communicate with someone or I'm able to communicate with somebody. Um, so that was the first sort of point of communication. Um, added to that then, my next introduction to technology was the iPhone. And uh, a cousin of mine f f um, saw a promotional video where he saw a guide dog and a guide dog user using an iPhone and it was at the time, what was novel about the idea was the Siri aspect. And he thought about me and thought that, you know, I might be able to benefit from this. So he arranged for me to have an iPhone and since having the iPhone, um, I would say that it's probably transformed my quality of life. It's extended my social um, circle. Um, it's enabled me to be able to speak to people I felt that were inaccessible or, uh, you know, and unable to sort of to be able to be contacted. Um, it's opened up email to me. It's opened up uh, FaceTime. Um, I'm pleased to tell you that I've 
subsequently got married and uh, as my wife is not with me I'm able to Skype her um, I'm able to send and receive text messages um, you know I can now surf the net surf the web um, I could shop online I'm, I, I, I use eBay um, so all these things whilst you know commonplace and somewhat perhaps just you know uh, trivial to, to, to many today I cannot tell you is 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 immense to myself it's given me the, every little aspect of technology gives me hope and belief and confidence that yeah you know I can I can be almost accepted in the world outside whilst I do not have eye contact whilst I perhaps um, um, cannot engage in that, in that way but I do have technology and that technology helps to bridge the gaps helps to reduce and repair that bereavement um, and uh, so you know as with regards to accessibility and, and the work that is being done um, I cannot champion it you know more than 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 I do in my everyday life as working for an accessibility organization. Um, so, if you're out there and you influence change, then for me, I cannot thank you enough because, quite frankly, because of you, I'm here today. Um, and I'd like to finish on that. Okay. Yeah. We have time for probably one quick question for Gavin. Oh, okay, yeah. If uh, anyone has any questions. Who in that case, I think. Oh, I'll ask a question. Okay, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, what what uh, excites you in kind of future tech about in terms of accessibility? Hmm, that's a really good question. <laughs> well, no one else offered one. Yeah. Um, future tech. I'm. I'm sort of a boring person, I suppose, and I, I like HTML and, and ARIA because I know that those specification actually expose those correctly to uh, screen reader users, and I, that, that's my job. That's what I do, um, and, and I, I suppose, yeah, that future tech, um, that's it's, it's standards, it's specification, that's, that's what I like. Um, yeah. Why about cars then? Um, not so much, no. It's uh, because of the way you know the, the the environment that I work in. It's it's you know within the team is like thirty people there, and seeing how something can be made accessible to that user group, um, it's it's opening up things to them. So I, yeah, that's what excites me. <coughs> Loads of questions now. <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah. Um, so um, a lot of this is seemingly from that kind of um, coding and um, yeah. uh, sort of aspect. Um, a lot of us here, I imagine, are coming from a sort of more user experience, yes. Yes. Yeah. non-coding kind of uh, aspect. But yeah. for you, um, I'm guessing that you come from that, that background. You were talking the talk in terms of... Um, as, as in coding-wise yeah. or...? I, I've done a bit, yes. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a developer. Um, I'm, my background is more on the user experience side of things uh, and obviously learned coding as well, obviously, because that's how, from a design perspective, um, first of all, on how that would impact on the user to finding out how then that markup is actually exposed to technologies. Because that's key, because there's two sides of it. Because one is how you design something first of all, um, and then obviously how that's marked up is obviously the support for the assistive technology combined with the browser. Um, so yeah, there's, there is two sides. So I'm now sort of, I'm a halfway house between both, I'd say, uh, basically. Okay, come on, Gavin, please. All right, thank you.